The title of my sermon tonight is, Why I Love the Church. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to read 23 through 27. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her a, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he, she should be holy and without blemish. There are many people in our world today that are very cynical when you speak of the church. They see the church as a cold, sterile, formal institution that will run over people if they get in the way. However, many people see the church as we do, something to love. I love coming here because no matter what mood I'm in when I walk in the door, when I leave, I'm in a better mood than when I came. Don't come here very often in a bad mood because I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to come. Granted, the human side of the church remains in a constant state of renovation and repair, but that's really no reason not to love it. Is this church perfect? No. Are we perfect? No. Allow me to share with you this evening four reasons why I love the church. First reason is I love the church because Christ loved the church. My aim in life is to be like Jesus and I hope yours is too. And I know that the group that we have here tonight, that's the, that's the case. We're all here to be more like Jesus. I'll never be perfect and neither will you. But I hope I look more like him today than when I was 20 years old. I was baptized when I was 19 years old into Christ and I would hope that I'm a better person than I was then. Ephesians 5.25 tells us about how Christ loves the church. And he tells us men that we should love our wives the same way Christ loves the church. Do we always do that? No, because again, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. But in this verse, notice the extent to which Jesus loved the church. He gave himself for her. Same as any person here that's married would probably give their life for their wife they had to or their husband for that matter do you value the things valued by those you love I value the church because I on Wednesday night whoever coined the phrase that you get your batteries recharged that's the perfect thing to say about Wednesday night service because you can be down the world can drive you into the ground Monday, Tuesday, but when you come here on Wednesday, when you leave here, at least when I do, it's like a recharging. The second reason I love the church is because the church is my family. I have a physical family, of course, but everyone here, I look at them as being a part of the church family. Members of the church are called children of God. In Galatians 3.26 it reads, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And we're also brothers and sisters. And Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 and 2, it lets us know how we're supposed to treat the members of the church. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with all purity. 
because we're family, we support each other. We don't have to go through anything in life alone unless we choose to do that ourselves. And I would recommend that if you have a problem or you're having some kind of an issue in your life, don't try to go it alone. Try to let the people in the church know and they will support you and they will encourage you. In Proverbs 13, 20, it reads, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of a fool will destroy. And also Proverbs 27, 17 reads, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. I know it sounds kind of silly to use that as a, as a description, but really, we sharpen each other. We sharpen each other in more ways than we know. Mm -hmm. And we need to be sharpened also. Yes. We need to help each other and encourage each other. And I feel that happens here. So. Amen. And the third reason I love the church is because of its impact on the world. Don't we all really worry and fret about the condition or the state of the world? As we look around us, we see people hating God and uh, rebuking God, saying bad things about God. I remember the days of my younger younger years when they used to say that God was dead. I used to hear that all the time. God is dead. God is dead. Just think what this world would be like without the preserving influence of the church. Think about where your friends and your relatives or anybody you come in contact with would be without the Christian influence that they get from you. You may be the only Bible they see or hear. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16, it says, Believers are salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Lots of times when I'm saying my private prayers, I end that prayer and I ask God to let me be the light on the hill. To the world let them see him in me to where I could lift them up the church is a moral voice and a conscience in society and that's why people are just trying to beat it down and drive it out because they don't want that conscience if you're doing evil things it's gonna bother your conscience unless you're just totally evil and your conscience is going to let you know. And that's what the church does. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be the conscience of the world because it's getting worse and worse, let's face it. And the fourth reason is, I love the church because it is the saved. Jesus saves, not the church. But in the church, the ones that are in the church, or Jesus is saved once. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it reads, and this is our text for tonight, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. We must strive to make sure that we make the church pure. And we must make it pure in our lives first, and then bring it here and make the church pure. If I'm not a part of the church, then no matter what else I accomplish in life, it's all been for nothing. 
I'm so glad that I was led to the church, led to the truth, and then I'm able to preach. I've mentioned this many times. If you'd have told me when I was 17 or 18 years old that I would be standing before people speaking, I would have told you that you were out of your mind. Because any time I had to ever get up in front of the class and say anything, I always dreaded it like the plague. And that, you know, and I'm so glad that I was able to develop into being able to present the word. But we all need to present the word to the people that are around us. If not by word, at least by our example. I want to read this little story to you. It's called Pedal. So I want to, called Pedal. Pedal. Like pedaling a bike? Yeah. I'm going to end with this. At first I saw God as an observer, like my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong. This way God would know whether I merited heaven or hell when I died. He was always out there, sort of like the president. I recognized his picture when I saw it but I didn't really know him at all. But later on, when I recognized my God better, it seemed as though life was rather, the, rather like a bike ride on a tandem bike, and I noticed God was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has, been, has not been the same since. Life with God that makes life much more exciting. If we let life, if we let God take our lives. When I had control, I knew the way. I was rather boring, but predictable. It was always the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful cuts upon the mountains and through the rocky places and at breakneck speed. It was all I could do to hang on. Even though I looked like, it looked like madness, he kept saying, pedal, pedal. I worried and became anxious asking, where are you taking me? He just laughed and didn't answer. And I found myself starting to trust him. I soon forgot my boring life and entered into the adventures. And when I'd say, I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. And he told me to, he took me to people with gifts that I needed gifts of acceptance, love, and joy. They gave me their gifts to take on my journey, our journey that is God's and mine. And we were off again. He said, give the gifts away. There's ex they're extra baggage. They're too much weight. So I did. I gave to all the people we met, and I found that in giving, I received, and still our burden was light. I did not trust him at first, in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck, but he knew bike secrets. He knew how to make it lean to take sharp corners, jump to clear places filled with rocks, fly to shorten scary passages. And I'm, lean, and I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the face with my delightful constant companion, God. And what I'm sure I can't go on anymore he just smiles and says, pedal, pedal. The greatest gift that you could ever give the Lord or your mother or your relations or anybody around you is to love the church of Christ supremely. If there's anybody here tonight that needs the prayers of the church, we can do that for you. Please come as we stand and sing.